welcome to a new episode of The Point. We've got great panelists for you guys today. We've got Rick Overton, who's a comedian and actor, an Emmy award-winning writer, recently seen on uh, TV shows like Chaos in the Office, movies like Bad Teacher and Cloverfield. We've got Steve Ross, who is chairman of the USC History Department, and he's Pulitzer-nominated author for Hollywood Left and Right, How Movie Stars Shaped American Politics. Uh, that is fantastic book that's right here. And then uh, Axel Caballero, who's the founder and producer of Quantum A, a Brave New Foundation campaign. In fact, we have a clip from you guys, and it's an amazing clip on how uh, anti-immigration laws are influenced by the private prison industry. It's fantastic. Other thing, points we have for you today, Phil Donahue on uh, the wars and Crispin Glover on how Hollywood is way too corporate. Let's get started with Phil Donahue first. Hi, I'm Phil Donahue, and I'm very pleased to have had this opportunity. We continue to be a warrior nation. How many bombs are we going to drop on how many countries? You know, if you drop a bomb on my house and you incinerate my family, there's only a few options I have. One, I can drink and put funny things in my nose and die of depression. I can join a peace group and travel the world in memory of the family that I lost, encouraging people to work for peace. There is a third option, and that is I will spend the rest of my life looking for you, you bastard. And when I find you, I will put a stake in your heart and smile when you die a slow and painful death. We call this terrorism. You can't argue or ask what would cause somebody to knock down our towers. You can't even talk about this because it's blaming the victim. So this is just one of the ways that war is made so easy. You know, Rick, I didn't see that coming. He's like, oh, you can join peace groups or put a dagger through their heart. Yeah. But you know, doesn't he have a good point that if somebody bombed your house, what would be your reaction? We're the descendants of oligarchic abusers. We come from European abusive parents. And even though you get in the wooden boat and you sailed away and you found this beautiful green new land, it doesn't mean you've shucked all the problems. You've still got a lot of Stockholm in your system. And you're, uh, you're going to take on a lot of their abusive traits. You, you know one trick for getting everything else you want from that point on. Gunpowder, the one thing the other guys facing this way don't have. I have the boomstick. That means you've got to learn my language. The one with the gun figures out you don't have to really love me and you don't have to agree. You have to nod and pretend to agree as long as I'm holding the boomstick. And we've basically gotten everything in a bully mindset because we had an advancement in weapons that they didn't have. And it's carried our mindset right till today. You know, it's funny, there was a, it, well, it was a funny joke on Modern Family, but there's something serious behind it as you were pointing it out there, Rick. A guy, you know, a woman who speaks Spanish on the show, the Gloria, is it? Uh, it the gorgeous one. Uh, it says, how come we all have to speak your language? And a crack, you know, uh, an old man who's cranky walks in and says, yeah, try winning a war. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, and, but it's true, you know, we, we, we've been fighting all these wars. But, but at this point, you know, Steve, I'm not sure what we're fighting for anymore. I, I mean, well, one thing was manifest destiny. Okay, we go conquer this land that we're on. I get that, right? You're right or wrong. I get it. Right. Like, what the hell are we doing in Iraq? And now that we're out, what the hell did we accomplish? That's a good question. <laughs> um, but when it, where, where he led off with is the idea that we're a warrior nation. And that's the key. So it, it, is, it doesn't just start with Iraq. It doesn't start with Afghanistan. It doesn't start with the first Gulf War. It starts with the first settlers who are coming over and greeted by the Indians. And what do we eventually do? Yep. We destroy them. We have been a warrior nation since the beginning. This is in our DNA. And some could argue we've brought civilization across a uncivilized continent. But that's only if you take civilization as being what you consider it to be, as opposed to what the other civilizations are doing. Yep. And, yeah, I, I yeah. remember the stories about how you know the guys come over and they call these uh, Native Americans, whether it was in South America or here in North America, and they call them savages and then cut off their heads. So wait, which one's the savage? <laughs> you know. But at the same time, look, America, you know, Axel used to have 
a, a great side to it, right? Where we started the United Nations. We started the idea of human rights. Not, not us alone, and there were many people who, who participated in that. But that's where the idea of American exceptionalism came in from because we did things that were not just in, ba in favor of our empire. Now, you could call it enlightened self-interest, right? But there was that positive side. I feel like we kept only the bad side and really didn't keep any of that good stuff anymore. Well, because I think that essentially one thing that it also exemplifies what America is right now is the for-profit motive. I mean, I think that that, you know, that have we, how we've seen it for the past, you know, how many decades, we've seen how contractors have really taken over our, even our, our basic, you know, decision-making process. And one of those decision-making processes is to make war. And I think that that has happened for the longest time. So, you know, when once we were fighting wars for a purpose, now we're fighting wars for profit. And I think that, that, that when you have that, you lose all, basically all motive for it. I actually want to go to the second part of Phil Donahue's video here, uh, and let's watch that. My documentary is titled Body of War. It's available on Netflix. The, uh, the film looks at the life of a warrior turned anti-warrior. A Midwest kid, Kansas City, saw the president on the pile, wanted to go get the evildoers, signed up 913. And he winds up at Fort Hood and he wonders why he's going to Iraq. He thought he was going to Afghanistan. Too late now, he's shot in the spine five days after he arrives in Iraq. He can't cough. He, he certainly can't walk. Impotent, primal life male. People don't see this pain, and that's why we did this film. This is awful. This is the pain that is being sustained by thousands of families in this country, and we never saw them. The president said, you can't take pictures of the coffin, and the whole press corps said, okay. This war was uncovered, and we're still ignoring the people who made the sacrifice. So. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to show you what we've done. So he talks about wounded soldiers there, and it's a great point. In the Iraq War, our casualties uh, were 4,486 dead, but also 32,226 that were uh, injured. And obviously a lot of those injuries are very, very serious. A lot of those guys would have died in previous wars, but we saved their lives. But 20% have serious brain or spinal injuries. We're not talking about psychological injuries. We're talking about actual physical brain and spinal injuries. Uh, of the 4,486 that died, 54% uh, were under the age of 25. So we're lo losing our young boys and girls. In Afghanistan, 1,873 died, 14,342 uh, wounded. And then, of course, is the cost of the war in terms of uh, fortune, which is uh, nearly $1.3 trillion for Iraq and Afghanistan. That's just the cost up to now. Uh, so as you look at this, who in their right mind thinks that this was worth it? Well, you know, <clears throat> it gets to this idea of what does it mean to be a patriot. And in our country, every war we've had, whenever anyone has spoken out against the war at the very beginning, they're accused of being cowards, they're accused of being unpatriotic, that patriotism is following the flag where the president says we have to plant it, whether he's Democrat or Republican. And we talk about honoring our warriors, and yet in every single war, those warriors we so-called honor as they go off to war, we do nothing for when they return home. They come back, and uh, I would tell your audience, if they've never seen it, I, I think the most powerful film I've ever seen, I think, frankly, the best American film ever made, The Best Years of Our Lives, 1946, William Wyler, and it gets right to the heart of this myth of the good war in World War II. That if you remember, those of us who were in the Vietnam generation, we talked about how we dishonored the soldiers, unlike World War II, where we hailed them and they were great heroes. And yet what this film shows is those people coming back had 15 minutes of public recognition, and then they were forgotten, they were tossed away. And if you had lost your arms, if you didn't have a job anymore, the hell with you, figure it out on your own. So where's the patriotism in that? Whether it's World War II, Vietnam, or today, what do we do with our warriors? And, and let alone World War I, where they had to set up encampment across from the White House to try to get paid on something that they were promised, and then the army comes and clears them out of, in front of the White House. I mean, it was a crime what happened to the guy 
guys after World War One. And Rick, it happens every time. And now all the Republicans are warmongering on Iran. We got to go to Iran. We got to go to Iran. These guys that pretend to love their soldiers, these commanders, these officers, they love their soldiers the way a dog trainer loves a greyhound. He loves you as long as you run to death on the track for him. They love you the way uh, a farmer loves a chicken. They, they love you for your purpose, but not for who you are. And the definitions of words are being given up to people who are taking over. A lot of this is redefinition of our language to us. They're taking a word, remachining it, putting it on a new show, and then feeding it back with a different meaning. So that you remember your parents telling you that word, but they're giving you its new description now. See, I, I disagree with Rick on one point. I don't think it's the <clears throat> military leaders who are driving that. I think it's the politicians. You talk with most generals to the extent that they will talk in the press, they never want to go to war. They say war is the last thing we want to do. I meant to say yeah. the people sent starting the wars. But you those know what? Who are I actually with, disagree yeah. with you a little bit, Steve, because I think the generals have gotten corrupted. I think they're all waiting for their big fat paycheck after uh, they get out, out of service, which the, if they were good boys and girls and they played ball, they're all going to get paid. If you weren't, then they're not going to pay you at Lockheed Martin and Boeing and all those places. I think, is it the politicians? Absolutely, but it's all of them. I think we should do a 10-year lobbying ban or working in the defense industry uh, for any general for, and for any politician. Because I think they're all incredibly excited about war. Is that because everybody's going to get rich? Do you know that the annual amount of money we spent on air conditioning along in Iraq and Afghanistan per year was over $20 billion? Somebody gets rich off these wars. Am I making too much of it, Axel, or do you think that that's one of the primary motivating factors? I think that is the primary motivating factor right now. I mean, the fact that you see war contracts, uh, war contractor lobbyists in the halls of Congress and going directly and speaking to the legislators who actually legislate the war, uh, I think that that's a sad place to begin with in the first place. I mean, there is a huge interest. And the sad thing about it more so is that who are we putting now in the front lines of it? We're putting minorities of color, we're putting Latinos who have no opportunities right now, who don't, can't go to school because can't afford it, who don't have a job, whose only source of income now is to go to war, whose only uh, ability to, to have a life is to go to war. And we couldn't even get the DREAM Act passed that if you're willing to die for this country, at least we give you citizenship after a whole bunch of years. No, no. Even if you're willing to die for this country, we don't give a damn about you, and we're not going to give you citizenship anyway. It's stunning. There's another cost of war that doesn't get factored in, which is the cost to what people wind up doing, what they become during war. You know, as you were saying, Steve, you know, as we're rushing into war, yeah, let's go, it's fantastic. But they don't think, hey, you know what, war is hell. And later, they'll come turn around and go, well, what are you going to do? Of course, that happens in war. Well, then you shouldn't have started it. Yeah, well... One of the things I tell my students when we talk about whether it's the Revolutionary War or whether it's Vietnam or Iraq, when I ask them, what are you, you, know, what are you willing to go to war for? And they come up with abstractions. And then I tell them, go to talk. And <clears throat> I often have at least one or two vets in my classes now. And I say, go and talk with a vet. Go and talk with a parent who is in Vietnam. Go and talk with a grandparent in World War II. And here's what they're going to tell you. For all the hoopla that surrounds going to the war, you will never be the same person when you come back. You will be a different person and not in a positive way. Even if you come back with your arms and your legs and everything intact, what does it do to a human being who is trying to kill somebody every day and somebody else is trying to kill them every single day? It changes who you are. It kills part of your humanity. And you got to ask, what's the cost? What's the cost? What's worth losing your humanity for. We're desensitizing folks uh, already, especially our, our young folks that are coming in and seeing this as a video game. I mean, we see it, you know, particularly with Latino kids, we see them watching TV, and in between TV, they have these amazing, spectacular ads about how, you know, Call of Duty's type of style, where you're gonna just shoot the first person that, that you're gonna see, where you're gonna manage a drone from, you know, a, a particular remote location and be able to get away with it. And then the reality is different, and they go and see the reality, and it breaks them, and it breaks their families back at home as well. Right. The suicide rate is through the roof. And it's the other deaths of the soldiers that the, we never hear about. Yeah. 
but it's through the roof. It is almost matching and surpassing the other number. That uh, perhaps it has passed the other number now. Their suicide rate is so substantial, and it's because you go to where your rules that you've been bred and trained on uh, are okay and acceptable to a place where none of your rules are acceptable when you're in traffic and the gear slam makes you realize it makes them realize how they don't fit here anymore and they don't feel like there's another place that uh, aside from going back to hell where do you go right that's to me that is the, the great curse of it the great hell of it is this training with no retraining right and my last point on this is the guys we haven't even talked about yet the 150,000 to a million Iraqis that were killed in that war. Mm. You know, the, the, the people that we dropped the bombs on. And that's another, of course, enormous tragedy of these wars. Whatever you do, do not let them take us to Iran. All right, when we come back, Crispin Glover uh, is going to make a very interesting point about how Hollywood is way too corporate. We're back on the point. Uh, now we're going to get a very interesting point by Chris Glover, who, of course, was uh, one of the stars of Back to the Future and Charlie's Angels. He's been in a great number of movies. Let's see his take on Hollywood. Hello, my name is Chris Glover, and uh, my point of discussion is that I, I feel the United States is the most well-propagandized culture there has been. And when I say propagandized, I mean in the sense that there is a uh, negative aspect to films, uh, media, academia, politics, that people are not realizing is not serving them well wherein there are either metaphorical or direct uh, points that are being made which really may not serve uh, the people that are actually enjoying those films. What does it mean when there are films that deal with aliens, as in outer space aliens, being killed? Is there, is there a direct analysis or is there a metaphorical analysis of, of what that actually means? Does it mean that people uh, that are watching the film are more comfortable with US government killing alien people as opposed to outer space aliens? I, I tour around with my own films, I address this issue, and I've, I've had the experience where people get upset when these kinds of things are, are, are thought about, because people don't like to feel like their media is not serving what their genuine uh, benefits would, would be. So that's, that's my point. And uh, CrispinGlover.com is where people can find out about where I tour and, and, and show my films, so thank you. All right, uh, Crispin's a little trippy, okay, and I wanna talk about his alien point in a second, but I like that he's out there challenging people to think in a different way, right? Uh, but let's start with the idea that, you know, conservatives always say Hollywood's way too liberal. Uh, you, Steve, you wrote a whole book about it, right? right. Uh, Hollywood left and right. So, but does Crispin have a, a point there about how corporate Hollywood is? Uh, <laughs> He gives us two points which strike me as so obvious that uh, why are we discussing it? Hollywood is corporate and that film can desensitize people. That seems to me the take. Well, Hollywood was corporate starting around re in, in earnest around 1914 when businesses and uh, particularly when the 1% uh, of the financial institutions, we've got a 99 percenter here, <laughs> began to realize that this new industry that was working largely for immigrants and blue-collar people was actually making a ton of money. And that's when you got the first uh, corporate bonds being floated by Wall Street. Mm -hmm. And between 1914 and 1918, you had a huge amount of money coming in from Wall Street. And in return, places like AT&T, American Sugar, DuPont, all demanded General Motors put in tons of money and they all demanded seats on the corporate boards of these studios. So Hollywood has been corporate all these years, okay? 
Now it's just multinational corporate as opposed to just locally controlled corporate. So what's new there? Uh, it's a money-making business. It's not a consciousness-raising business. I, I hear you on that, but I think a great majority of Americans don't see that away at all. I think the conservatives won. If you ask people, right. oh, is Hollywood corporate or liberal? I bet at least 80% say liberal. Well, here's the two things I found in my book, uh, Hollywood Left and Right. The first is even though the Hollywood left has been more numerous and visible, the Hollywood right has had a much greater impact on American political life, changing the very nature of our state, of our government, undermining the New Deal and creating a very different America. And the second thing is, conservatives will always tell you Hollywood has always been the bastions of liberals. In fact, it's the conservatives it's Louis B. Mayer at MGM. It's the Hollywood Republicans in the right who fashioned the first permanent relationship between a studio and a party. And starting in 1928, he turns MGM into a publicity wing of the Republican Party. The liberals have never had that kind of long-term uh, impact in the industry. And then Roger Ailes takes over from there at some point. <laughs> of course, not directly well, afterwards. There's a, actually, there's a trajectory because Louis B. Mayer turns MGM into a training ground for the Republicans. And eventually, you can see a trajectory from Louis B. Mayer to his protege, Ronald Reag uh, George Murphy. Murphy's protege is Ronald Reagan. Reagan's protege of, of sorts is Charlton Heston. And then you can leap up to Arnold Schwarzenegger. This is a Hollywood political right that has a tougher political backbone than anything on the Hollywood left. Right, and we didn't get Sean Penn or Susan Sarandon as president. We did get Ronald Reagan as president. And we had a Senator Murphy and a Governor Schwarzenegger. That's right. Now, Rick, you're in Hollywood. You work in Hollywood. What's your experience? Uh, um, how do you green light Battleship, okay? Who green lights that? Who says, yes, that game I played as a child. <laughs> the, the, uh, you sunk my battleship, bam, go. Spend millions of dollars to make this. Oh man, and that must be the liberal media that made all the G.I. Joe movies and everything like that. Here's, this, here's something interesting. I, I wanna just pose this. You remember when a hero saved other people? That was a hero in film. Right. Here's the insidious way they've snuck their crap in here. Is now a hero has killers chasing him, so he gets in his car and drives the wrong way into oncoming traffic to get away from the killers. Right. It's just, this is just a little right-wing way of getting into your mind. No, you just simply save yourself. Because all those vans that are flipping and crashing to get out of his way, there's a family in that van. We never touch or address that. It's like the movie Ronin. You just, everyone's crashing and dying while you save yourself. And I had never thought of it that way. That's the modern hero. And that's just the sneaky little way they put it in. And, and you know, uh, Rick makes a great point. Who's the guy who's going to make the decision on whether you're going to make the movie or not? The money guy, of course. Yeah. And, and, and to Steve's point, uh, huge corporations own these studios now. It's not, not anybody who's a liberal. It's the, these giant corporations making the decisions. Absolutely. And we're already seeing that they don't, they're don't. they definitely not changing any of their ways. I mean, the SOPA, you know, which is a, a huge you know, element of this discussion, particularly the Stop Online Piracy Act, I mean, it just fits into that model that is like any particular thing that would challenge the studios, uh, just, just like the internet could challenge the studios in the in the type of content that is produced by individuals and not by conglomerates you know they don't want anything to do with it right. because they know that there's the money there well on the other hand though you know it, we make fun of Fox News for saying the Muppets are politicized and all, all that stuff but look you, you know there are liberal filmmakers that are very powerful you look at Avatar it's a clearly liberal movie come on we, we got to call it what it is. I mean, does anybody disagree? I, I think it well, is. Well, Avatar may be a liberal movie, but James Cameron is no liberal. James Cameron made a very conservative film, Titanic, which passed as a liberal movie, saying, look why at the Why is it conservative? I'll tell you why. I did an op-ed piece years ago for the LA Times, and I wrote that if you were to take a movie audience from the 1920s, drop them into a theater and show them Titanic, and say, who directed that? They'd say Cecil B. DeMille because it's exactly what DeMille's sly conservatism that passes as liberalism. Here you get um, Jack, right, the working class kid who uh, wins the love of Rose, and you have that one scene on the Titanic where he, they put him up in a 
uh, tuxedo and he goes down and we see how much smarter he is than any of the rich guys. And then we have the shots underneath of the Irish dancing their jigs. Right. And what's the message in the film? That the working class, given an opportunity, are the equal of the elite and that they actually have more fun and that they are in many ways the moral superior. Except I ask you one question, when the Titanic goes down, who lives and who dies? <laughs> hmm. Well, okay, again, a point I had not considered before. Okay, but overall, I, you know, I gotta be honest with you, I'm not buying it. I still think it's a liberal position. Titanic? This, yeah, no. I mean, look, the guy, look, the hero Why? dies at the end. I got you, right? I, I hope I'm not giving it away. The, the ship sinks, okay? Uh, but. But the, the middle class are the good guys. Except, no, it's not the middle class. It's the working class. But what it really says in the end is every class should stay within their own class. I that don't think it says be, that. I think you You will think be the happier. message is if you don't stay in your class, you're going to die when your sh ship hits an iceberg? Well, uh, <laughs> what happened? Okay, well, that did what happen. Happened? All right, maybe it's, a, it's more subtle than I realized. Uh, and then the other thing I would like to challenge uh, Crispin's point on is, you know, he talks about, how, you know, we're killing the aliens. It's an interesting metaphorical way of saying, like, why when you meet a, a foreign culture, immediate idea is destroy it, right? Mm -hmm. And you see that in all the different movies. And uh, my favorite was Independence Day when Will Smith actually punches the alien and knocks him out. It was, awesomely yeah. absurd but I enjoyed the movie okay and there's a reason why they do these corporate movies for the masses because masses like me enjoy them right so doesn't it make sense in some way Rick um, yeah well I you know the, the the big the big thing to me is aliens don't need to attack humans nothing is doing a better job of killing off humans than other humans we are the deadliest <laughs> thing that we have ever faced we the are aliens the virus. <laughs> just merely need to wait. But uh, I, I know this, it's, it's the little guy beats a bully story in its hundred different faces. And, uh, that, and that's the same thing Bread and Circus was. It's the same thing sports are. It's giving you a fake hero beating a fake bully while you sit there and eat something. Now, let me take off of Rick's point, because I was thinking about that before, and you said it really well. He mentions the alien movies, and what's really his critique? That they desensitize us to violence. I would say much more dangerous than the alien is what you said. It's the David versus Goliath tale. Mm -hmm. That it's Hollywood, the, the main, when people have asked me, what's the, is Hollywood liberal, is it conservative? What I would say is if you look at political films, self-consciously political films, the most popular from the beginning of the movie industry to today are anti-authoritarian films. Yeah, absolutely. Where and David yes. beats Goliath, mm -hmm. starting with Charlie Chaplin and working your way up through, I consider actually one of the most dangerous films ever made, is Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. <laughs> Why? Because here you have Jefferson Smith, Jimmy Stewart, going up against the Rupert Murdoch of his day, mm. the guy who controlled the radio newspapers throughout the entire Midwest. And in two hours, in just two hours, <laughs> Jimmy Stewart solves all the problems and good triumphs over evil. And what anyone who's ever been involved in movement politics knows is we are talking about a commitment of decades, not just years, but decades. And movies like this, while they make us feel good, and they, and they do give us a sense of hope that David can beat Goliath, what they make us forget is it takes David decades to get ready to beat Goliath. And for every David that beats Goliath, you got 99 Davids dying by that one Goliath. Well, if, if, he, if he was here, he'd say, oh, Professor Ross, cut it out, cut it out. You're discouraging people. That's good. <laughs> All right, so my last point on this is, look, I think some movies are liberal, some movies are conservative, and we enjoy a wide, wide variety of those. But the guys who make the decisions are the guys who are the ultimate deciders, right? And they're the guys with the money. Keep it real. Now, when we come back, Quantum A has a really interesting video on how, uh, unfortunately, some of the businesses in this country are driving the anti-immigrant uh, mood that you see and the anti-immigrant laws that you see in our country. Back on the point, and now we have uh, really actually, I think, a brilliant video by Quantum A uh, on how uh, the law in Arizona on immigration got made, and I think it's a little stunning. Let's watch it.
The detention of migrants is a multi-billion dollar industry. One in which immigrants are traded like products. They are for sale to the highest bidder. Who benefits and who profits? Corrections Corporation of America, or CCA, the GEO Group, and the Management and Training Corporation combined own over 200 facilities in the nation. With over 150,000 bed spaces for a total profit of close to $5 billion per year. Private prisons profit like a hotel. The more occupants that go in, the more money comes out. You just sell it like you're selling cars, or real estate, or hamburgers. Private prisons rely on anti-immigrant laws that guarantee them access to fresh inmates. Here's how they do it. The American Legislative Exchange Council, or ALEC, is an extreme right-wing membership organization comprised of state legislators and powerful multinational corporations, including the Corrections Corporation of America. ALEC is the most active private prison lobbyist group, pushing for anti-immigrant laws like Arizona's SB 1070. Russell Pierce, like CCA, is an ALEC member, one with obscure ties to national white separatist neo-Nazi groups. During an ALEC meeting, CCA and Pierce crafted a model legislation that became, almost word for word, Arizona's SB 1070. Whether people are undocumented or not doesn't matter. As long as they fill the detention facilities for days, months, or even years. SB 1070 and their copycat laws sprouting up across the country represent the perfect money machine. Axel, you are the founder and producer of Quantum A. That was really powerful. Uh, how many people do you think have any idea that that anti-immigration law has something to do with private prisons? Uh, I think you know the percentage is really small. I think within the Latino community, we've seen a, an awakening, you know, particularly with actions like this, and also because we live it. We know who are going to where, and we know that most of our immigrant community is going to detention facilities, and we know that these detention facilities are making money off of it. So we know it. The problem is that in the outside world, it's not known. Uh, this video, in particular, kind of raised awareness of it, but I think that there is a lot of work to be done, particularly the amount of money that is made in these facilities, the amount of money that is in the... In Rick, if we uh, are giving people an incentive to make $72,000 a year by imprisoning folks, aren't they going to have the incentive to imprison more folks? I mean, isn't this the most obvious thing in the world? It would have a lot to do with explaining why the U.S. government doesn't care about America's desire to legalize marijuana. I mean, and bingo, and people don't talk busting, about that. Busting marijuana users is like a hunter hunting corn. <laughs> it doesn't run away, it just sits there, you just harvest it. It's the simplest thing you can harvest. Yeah, the war on drugs, I mean, this is like as futile as our embargo on Cuba. Like, do, does anybody think like, oh, another year and I think we're gonna win? No, the point is that we're not supposed to win. We're just supposed to pack people into prisons, among the many other terrible things that the war on drugs does. Uh, but, you know, again, to this point of this insidious group, Alec, this business group, that, you know, it, and Steve, I find it logical. If you're a business and you want to make more money, of course you're going to do this. But it's insidious in that they buy our politicians and then get whatever they want, no matter what the cost is to the citizens. Well, that's because they would argue they are representing good capitalist values, that we want to privatize everything in this country because the myth that... Um, I, I would say they are thinking conservatives. Some of us who grew up uh, in an earlier age could see people like William Buckley, Barry Goldwater, who I certainly never agreed with, but these people were intelligent. And they spoke intelli intelligently, and they spoke logically, and they were willing to debate. Now we don't have that anymore. We just have ideologues who are telling us that somehow privatizing things are going to help, but the worst thing is when we privatize things like prisons, it also means forget about it. So the public, we share the blame too, that the public is doing nothing, that we are buying into this somehow privatization works. I don't know the figures on the private um, business of prisons versus government-owned prisons, but I know in healthcare, for example, it's something like 
Uh, Medicare is three, three and a half cents on every dollar for administrative costs. And the private health care industries are something like 23 cents to 25 cents. So where does this notion that privatization makes things both more efficient and more just come in from? Certainly doesn't make much sense for the fire department. You know, there's like three houses get saved and the one guy didn't make a payment. They're just sitting around having a smoke watching his house burn down. Yeah, they, that's been happening across the country, by the way. That's not theoretical. But here's the main thing. In, in public prisons, for example, or public health, for that matter, is that there's no incentive to add more people to it mm. because it's, there's more cost. Right. In mm. the private system, there is incentive to add more people because they make money per person. I mean, that's the main point, and that's the reason why we're seeing an expansion of detention facilities yeah. across the and country. And why the video was great is that you get a sense of connecting the dots. So this guy's got an incentive to make money. So what does he do? He goes to a legislator, and he says, look, I can give you campaign donations. Maybe after, if you lose at some point, I can give you a job. So now that guy's got an incentive to do this guy's bidding, right? And then the guys at the end of the chain are powerless. So that's why you got all these kids who get locked up for the war on drugs or SB 1070, et cetera. Do the bankers ever get locked up? The guys who cost us billions of dollars, trillions of dollars, did they ever get locked up? Of course not, because the guys with the money win. No, and in fact, the head of the U.S. Marshals was a lobbyist for CCA or worked, you know, counseling Oh, really? CCA. Oh, I see so another like, thing I didn't know. <laughs> how, how can you fight that establishment? In particular, what's that is, is precisely to that point that is selling the idea that they're better, that they're more cost efficient, that they save us money, and that we can forget about the problem. It's completely the opposite. One of the videos that we're releasing in the next couple of weeks uh, deals with a town in Texas, Littlefield, that went bankrupt because one of these private prison corporations got a multi-million dollar contract in the town. Right, in Jefferson County, Alabama, was convinced by J.P. Morgan that if they did their sewer system that it would be cheaper. Turned out it blew up the whole town. It was so expensive, the entire town went bankrupt, okay? I, I think the other thing is <clears throat> people who aren't really paying attention because there's so many other things in their lives, they also are believing this sort of myth that if we privatize things like prison, and we know private business works much more efficiently than government, we could have more money for government to spend on other things that are important. <laughs> when in fact, all I can say is I would like to have 56, if it's $200 a day f to put a prisoner in there, that's $5,600 a month. How many of us would like that as our mortgage payment? Think of what the country would be if everyone could get $5,600 a month to pay their mortgage. And, and, and everyone thinks the other great detachment is they think that they're somehow separated from this being taxes that they're paying for it. We have no idea how much we're actually paying for all these private things. Absolutely. In fact, the budget, every year that we do the budget for DHS and for the amount of money that we're going to spend on immigration policy, it's coming out of... Where is it coming? And, and this money goes to Healthcare. private. Exactly. And this goes directly into the pockets of private. And it's so business. easy because then they turn around and they say, well, these guys had it coming. They're criminals, right? You know, or they, oh, they crossed the border illegally, okay? Everybody had it coming. And then so it's easy to marginalize these people. They pick on the most powerless, the weakest members of our society. It's supposed to be the other way around. We're supposed to protect. Uh, the, the weak and, and the powerless, and we flip that on its head, and it's disgusting. You know, you mentioned something in the video about neo-Nazi groups and Pierce's connection. What is that? Uh, basically, Pierce has been, when, when he was leading up to getting elected as, uh, as a state senator and, and president, uh, uh, particularly of Arizona, he had strong connections, which were all already documented by, uh, by different media groups, uh, with d different neo-Nazi groups and white separatist groups in Arizona. Uh, he was active with them. He particularly you know, posed in pictures with them and dialogue with them. And that is the, the really strange but you know, obvious connections. There's a for-profit motive, and then there's a political agenda and yeah. when those two connect you know you have something like SBT. you know the movie uh, machete yeah. you know so over the top I watched it I was amused by it but then as you find out the real facts you're like Jesus that's pretty close to true <laughs> pretty much <laughs> it's unbelievable and my final point on this is the way that you save money is you do public financing of elections now conservatives will say wait a minute that's us giving money to the politicians that sounds terrible no it doesn't because if they don't need to raise money from people like these private prison corporations that actually will save us a ton of money because look at all the money we're wasting on these private prisons and all the people that we're wrongly imprisoning because we've got a system where our politicians get funded by the guys who are going to make money off of imprisoning us etc cetera, etc cetera. So look, uh, you know what I think, wolf-pack.com. That's our uh, website to get a constitutional amendment on this. Obviously, I'm a huge believer in that idea. 
All right, and I want to make one final point for the week here, and it is on uh, President Obama's selections for his uh, inner circle. He did it again. Just when you got excited, hey, Bill Daly's going out, and this guy was a massive pro-banker. He said that we shouldn't do any, basically almost any regulation of the banking industry. He thought that Obama was too tough on business interests, which is a joke. He thought that they shouldn't do the health care plan, which is a joke. Why did you nominate or pick this guy to be your chief of staff? So he's leaving. Fantastic. Good news. So who do we get uh, in his place? Jack Lou, who is just as pro-banker, in fact, was a banker at Citigroup. In fact... He got paid millions of dollars, some of which, nearly a million, was after the bailout. And, well, uh, if he got rewarded so uh, well, he must have done well at Citigroup, right? No, disastrously. His group lost uh, over $500 million when he was in charge of it. Got so bad, they stopped doing accounting for that particular group. They merged it inside another group. That group lost $20 billion. They get $45 billion in TARP bailouts from us. He gets uh, nearly a million of it, two weeks later goes to the Obama administration. And now he is their chief of staff. Why is a guy who claimed to be in favor of change and claimed to be a progressive nominating people and picking people for his own staff that has nothing to do with confirmation in a lot of these cases? People like Tim Geithner, Rahm Emanuel, Larry Summers, Ben Bernanke, Peter Orzag, Jack Lew, Bill Daly, all of these guys, pro-banker, pro-establishment, nowhere near progressive. You know, unfortunately, the answer is if this guy walks like a duck, talks like a duck, maybe he's a duck, meaning President Obama. I don't think he's uh, a progressive. I think when you see the people that surround him, his first instinct is the establishment is right. Unfortunately, that's not a very good comment on the state of our government today because we voted for change and we got the establishment. All right, now I want to thank everybody who's part of the panel and who sent in points. Rick Overton, great job. Professor Steve Ross, chairman of the USC History Department and author of Hollywood Left and Right. It's Pulitzer nominated. Everybody check that out. And Axel Caballero, founder and producer of Quantum A. And of course, Phil Donahue, who sent in his point. Crispin Glover as well. A very bold point on his part. And then the video we saw from Quantum A. I want to thank all of you guys for participating. And we'll see you all next week on The Point.